My name is Diana, and as I grew up, I was the princess of a castle. I barely comprehended the wealth my parents possessed. Bless their souls, they had more money than some countries. However, they ensured I understood the value of every penny. Money talks, but wisdom listens, Dad would say, while Mom insisted I learn how to budget before I could properly spell. Luxury life was a fairy tale until it wasn't. At the age of 12, their private jet crashed, turning my fairy tale into a stark reality overnight. Grandma took me in, and we lived in a modest house far removed from the opulence I was accustomed to. It was a different kind of life, where luxury was found in love and care rather than material things. My inheritance was a distant promise, locked away until I turned 25. So, I adapted, learned, and thrived under Grandma's guidance. College became my escape and grounding, and that's where Alex came into the picture. He was as far from my world as one could get, a scholarship kid with a heart of gold and a wit that could cut through any pretense. We clicked in a way I never expected. Bringing him home to meet Grandma was a nerve-wracking experience. I hadn't told him about the money. Better he doesn't know, not yet, Grandma had advised, and I saw the wisdom in her words. I wanted Alex to love me for me, not my bank account. Grandma, this is Alex. I introduced them, my stomach in knots. Nice to meet you, ma'am, Alex said, extending a hand that Grandma shook warmly. Sit, sit, Grandma gestured, her eyes twinkling as she took in Alex's nervous posture. You're the young man who's stolen my granddaughter's heart, she said. Alex blushed, a sheepish grin spreading across his face. Aya, I guess you could say that, ma'am. We sat down, and the conversation flowed more easily than I dared hope. Grandma shared stories of my parents, of me as a child. Stories that made Alex laugh and look at me with a warmth that made my heart swell. You've got a good one here, Grandma, he said, nodding towards me but looking at Alex. Takes after her mother, strong and kind. But don't let her fool you. She's got a bit of mischief in her, too. Alex chuckled, squeezing my hand under the table. The evening went on, filled with laughter and shared stories. Alex fit into our world like he was always meant to be there. As he helped Grandma with the dishes afterward, I knew I had made the right choice in bringing him into this part of my life. Walking him out later, Alex turned to me, a serious look on his face. Your grandma's amazing, you know? Hearing about your parents, your life, I feel like I understand you more, he said. I nodded, feeling a lump form in my throat. I'm glad, Alex. There's a lot to me more than meets the eye, I guess. He smiled, pulling me into a hug. I'm here for all of it, every layer. Doesn't matter what's in your bank account, it's you I care about. I hugged him back tighter than I ever had before. In that moment, I knew I could trust him. But I also knew the weight of the secret I was keeping. It was a delicate balance, one I hoped wouldn't tip and spill over. The ride to Alex's parents' house was a quiet one, filled with the kind of silence that's too thick to cut through. I could tell Alex was nervous, his hands gripping the steering wheel tighter than usual. You sure you're ready for this? I asked, trying to break the ice. Yeah, just, my mom can be a bit much. Don't take anything she says to heart, okay? Alex's attempt at a reassuring smile didn't quite reach his eyes. The house loomed ahead, grand and imposing. As we pulled up, my stomach twisted into knots. This was it, no turning back now. We were barely through the door when Alex's mom, Gloria, made her entrance. Her eyes landed on me like two laser beams, sizing me up in a way that made my skin crawl. So, this is the girl you've been hiding, she said, her voice as cold as the marble floors. Mom, this is Alex, began Alex, but Gloria waved him off. I know who she is. Come, let's sit. I prepared some tea. Her command was not to be ignored leading us into a living room that felt more like a showroom. The tea was served, and Gloria wasted no time. I hear you were raised by your grandmother. Must have been quite the humble upbringing, she said, the word humble sounding more like an insult. I clenched my jaw, fighting to keep my cool. My grandma taught me a lot about life, 
important stuff, not just fluff, I retorted. Gloria's lips twitched in a smirk. I see. And your parents. Gone too soon, I heard. Tragic, really. How does one cope without the proper guidance? Alex jumped in, clearly uncomfortable. Mom, that's enough. Let's not. No, it's okay, Alex. I interrupted, feeling a surge of defiance. Yeah, my folks are gone, and yeah, it was tough. But I got through it. Made me who I am. Gloria sipped her tea, her gaze never wavering. Interesting. And what about your future, dear? Any plans? Or are you just riding along on my son's coattails? That stung. I took a deep breath, reminding myself why I was here. I've got plans, big ones. And I don't need to ride on anyone's coattails to make them happen. The air was thick with tension. Alex, bless him, tried to change the subject. Mom, let's not do this, okay? We're here to enjoy each other's company, he interjected. Gloria set down her teacup, a calculated move. I'm merely trying to understand the woman my son has chosen. You can't fault a mother for caring about her child's future. The back and forth felt endless, a verbal tug of war where no one was winning. Just when I thought I couldn't take any more, Alex's sister Lily made her entrance. Her eyes were curious but held an edge of judgment that matched her mother's. So, you're the famous girlfriend. Heard a lot about you, not all good. I might add, Lily said, her voice dripping with disdain. I was about to snap back when Alex stood up. That's enough, both of you. We came here in good faith to share a part of our lives with you. If that's not something you can respect, then maybe we should leave. The rest of the visit was awkward, to say the least. Conversations felt forced, every laugh a little too loud. But Alex held my hand under the table, a silent promise that we were in this together. As we left, I couldn't help but feel a mix of relief and frustration. I'm sorry about that, Alex said once we were in the car. They can be a bit intense. I sighed, watching the lights of the house fade in the rearview mirror. It's not your fault, but man, your mom and sister, there's something else. Alex chuckled, a sad sort of sound. Yeah, they are. But hey, we survived, right? Survived and stronger, he said, agreeing. The wedding planning sailed smoothly enough, but the big day itself, that's when the storm hit. Lily, the sister-in-law-to-be, got soused beyond belief and decided it was showtime. In the middle of our reception, she staggered up, glass in hand, and slurred out accusations loud enough for the back row to hear. This one's a gold digger, doesn't know the first thing about our kind of life, illiterate, trying to snag my brother's cash. After that, there were other antics, molesting guests, and other things that are not customary to talk about in decent society. I felt my face flush hot with anger and humiliation. Without a second thought, I pulled out my phone and called the cops. This drama needed an audience, and I wasn't about to let Lily's performance go unchecked. The aftermath was a hurricane of accusations and threats. Gloria avowed revenge for the disgrace I'd brought upon their family. You've made a mockery of us. The press will have a field day with my daughter's antics, thanks to you. Gloria seethed. Alex was torn, trying to play peacemaker in a war that had no room for neutrality. I saw the strain in his eyes the way his shoulders sagged under the weight of his family's drama and his desire to keep us afloat. But I stood my ground, my resolve hardening. This wasn't just about me anymore. It was about drawing a line, about not letting wealth or the lack thereof dictate how I was treated. As the dust settled and the night grew quiet, Alex and I sat amidst the wreckage of what was supposed to be our happiest day. I'm sorry, he whispered, his voice heavy with unched tears. I never wanted any of this. I took his hand, feeling the rough edges of our new reality. We'll get through this, but things need to change, starting with setting boundaries with your family. The vow we made that night wasn't just about staying together. It was about fighting for the respect we deserved, about not letting old money or old grudges define our future. Two years slipped by since we said I do, and those vows felt heavier every day. Gloria practically vanished from our lives, and honestly, I didn't miss her one bit. But it wasn't just her absence that marked those years. 
It was Alex's changing attitude that really drove the wedge between us. He'd come home late if at all, muttering excuses about work that didn't quite add up. The warmth we once shared cooled into courtesy, and then even that faded. The tipping point came one night when he threw his jacket on the chair like it had personally offended him and said something I never thought I'd hear. You know, I could have done better, married someone with a bit more class, more in line with my circle. His words stung like a slap. I stood there gobsmacked, wanting to scream, to tell him about the fortune that was mine. But Grandma's voice echoed in my head, advising patients to see Alex for who he truly was. So I swallowed the truth and the hurt, biting back tears. I thought maybe, just maybe, if we had a child, it might bridge the gap between us, remind him of the love that brought us together. Alex, don't you think it's time we thought about having a baby? It could bring us closer. I ventured one evening, hoping to spark something of the man I fell in love with. His reaction was like a cold shower. A baby now? Don't be ridiculous. We're not ready for that not by a long shot. That conversation shut me down. It wasn't just the refusal. It was the disdain, the way he made it clear that what I wanted, what I thought could save us, was nothing but a foolish fantasy. Days turned into weeks, and those weeks into months of silence, of living side by side, but not together. Each rude remark, every late night, added another brick to the wall between us. I confided in Grandma, pouring my heart out over cups of tea that had gone cold before I could finish them. He's not the man I married, Grandma. I don't know if he ever was, I admitted. She listened, her eyes sad but understanding. You can't make someone be who you want them to be, darling. Sometimes we see what we want to see until we can't ignore the truth any longer, she said. Her words, though heavy, carried a sliver of relief. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't asking for too much. I just wanted a partner, someone who saw me as an equal, who respected me. But as the days passed, it became clearer that wasn't who Alex was, not anymore if he ever had been. The idea of leaving crossed my mind more times than I cared to admit, but every time it did, I pushed it away, hoping against hope that something would change, that the man I loved would find his way back to me. The vibe was set for a killer party, I'd gone all out for Alex's birthday bash, hoping to bring back a spark into what had turned into a pretty mundane marriage. No expense was spared, and the guest list was a who's who of our closest pals. Notably missing from the invite list were Gloria and Lily, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Their drama was the last thing I needed ruining the night. Alex was in high spirits, soaking in the adoration and well wishes from everyone. For a moment, it felt like we were back in the honeymoon phase, all laughter and inside jokes. But that bubble burst the second Gloria and Lily crashed the party, uninvited but clearly expecting to be welcomed. Turns out Alex had gone behind my back and invited them, hoping to avoid any family fallout. Their presence turned the atmosphere tense. Lily, in true form, made a beeline for the booze, dressed in an outfit that screamed, look at me and not in a good way. Gloria's snide remarks flew under the radar, each one a veiled jab at me or our marriage. As the night wore on, Lily's antics escalated, fueled by champagne and the need to be the center of attention. She started a rant about me not fitting into their family, how I was unworthy of their name. It was a mess, and Alex was nowhere to be found, too busy playing the good son to notice the circus unfolding. The climax of the evening was when Lily, a few sheets to the wind, decided to air out some dirty laundry, waving around some documents as she slurred out insults, each word a knife. The spectacle ended with her stumbling into the pool, documents flying everywhere. I rushed over, more out of curiosity than concern, and gathered the scattered papers. My heart sank as I pieced together what they were, divorce papers signed by Alex. It was like a punch to the gut, each signature a betrayal. I stood there numb as the reality of the situation washed over me. My husband, the man I had vowed to spend my life with, had decided our journey was over without so much as a word to me. The party around me faded into a blur as I clutched the documents, 
Alex's signature glaring up at me, confirming what I didn't want to believe. This wasn't just a party to remember. It was the end of everything I thought we had. In the aftermath of the pool incident, I sought clarity amidst the chaos. My heart pounded as I approached Alex, holding the soap documents that had unwittingly unveiled a truth I was unprepared for. Alex, what's this about? I demanded, my voice stronger than I felt, thrusting the divorce papers toward him. Before he could respond, his mother interjected with a smugness that made my skin crawl. Oh dear, looks like your little scheme didn't work out, did it? Alex is leaving you. Thought you could trap him with a baby for his money. I stared at Alex, searching his eyes for any sign of the man I married, but he couldn't meet my gaze. His silence was more telling than any words. With resignation, I signed the divorce papers. They were just a formality now, a closing chapter of a book I no longer wished to be part of. As the dust settled, Grandma approached, her presence a calming force. She didn't need to say anything. Her eyes conveyed volumes of empathy, understanding, and unspoken support that bolstered my resolve. It was then she decided to reveal the truth, not just to me, but to everyone present. She doesn't need any of your money, Grandma declared, her voice steady and strong. In a month, she turns 25 and will inherit a fortune far beyond what you could imagine. She's been raised to value people over wealth, to seek out genuine connections rather than financial gain. The room fell silent, the weight of her words hanging in the air. Gloria's face morphed from smugness to shock, then to a desperate kind of greed as she quickly began backpiddling, her apologies as transparent as they were insincere. Alex, too, seemed suddenly eager to rewrite the narrative, insisting his intentions were never to hurt me, that he was merely influenced by his mother. But it was too late. The veil had been lifted, revealing the stark reality of our relationship and the motivations behind it. I met their apologies with a quiet smile, not out of forgiveness, but out of an inner peace that came from understanding my worth independent of the wealth that awaited me. You've shown me your true colors, I said, my voice imbued with a newfound strength. As for surprises, well, I've prepared another one for you. At that moment, a loud honk echoed through the tension outside. A sleek luxury car rolled up to the gate the one I had secretly bought for Alex as a surprise. The irony wasn't lost on me. I couldn't help a bitter laugh as I excused myself, stepping outside to confront the final act of this drama. There it was, the epitome of luxury on four wheels, a symbol of the love I thought we shared, now just another piece in the game of pretense and betrayal. Without a second thought, I slid into the driver's seat, the leather cool and unyielding beneath me, much like my resolve. Grandma, ever my rock, joined me, her presence a silent testament to the strength and dignity that ran in our blood. Turning to face the house, I saw Alex and his mother at the door, their expressions a mix of confusion and awe. Everything from now on goes through my lawyer. I called out to them, my voice clear and devoid of warmth as I drove away. And don't worry about my stuff. I'll have a courier pick it up. Their faces, once smug and self-assured, now painted a picture of realization and loss, not just of the wealth they coveted. I turned the key, the car's engine purring to life, a sweet sound that promised freedom and new beginnings. Grandma and I shared a look, a silent agreement that this was the first step toward a future unburdened by deceit and manipulation. After the revelations and dramatic exits, the air seemed clearer as if the truth had not only unveiled the greed and deceit, but also cleansed the path ahead. It wasn't long before the first test of my newfound resolve came knocking, or rather calling. The phone rang, its shrill tone slicing through the calm like a knife. On the other end was none other than Lily, her voice dripping with an unfamiliar sweetness. Hey, I just wanted to, you know, clear the air between us. We're practically the same age, right? we could be friends. I couldn't help but let out a short, disbelieving laugh. The contrast between this sugary tone and her usual disdain was stark. Friends. I echoed the word, feeling it foreign. 
You mean like how friends don't badmouth each other at parties or try to humiliate them in front of everyone? There was a pause, a moment where I imagined I could hear the cogs turning in her head as she searched for a response. Well, you know, water under the bridge and all that, she attempted feebly. Water into the pool, you mean? I shot back, unable to resist the jab. The silence that followed was telling. It was clear that my refusal to play along had derailed her plans. Fine, be that way, she snapped, her veneer of niceness crumbling away. You'll regret this. I hung up, feeling a mix of amusement and sadness. It was a stark reminder of the facades people wear and the lengths they'll go to when faced with the consequences of their actions. The temptation to retaliate was there, a nagging thought in the back of my mind. I posted a video on social media of her falling into the pool. It went viral like wildfire. Within an hour, a thousand people had liked it. My sister-in-law was internet famous. She tried to call me, demanding I take it down, but I just blocked her. I was done with her fake sweetness and her nasty attitude. A week after that, my phone rang with a number I knew all too well. It was Gloria, her voice unnaturally sweet, offering an olive branch she hoped I'd grasp. Let's put the past behind us for Alex's sake. Can't we reconcile? She suggested, as if the wounds were mere scratches that could heal with a band-aid of words. No, Gloria, that ship has sailed. I replied, firm but not unkind. There was no anchor in my voice, just a resolute peace. I wish Alex well, but our paths are diverging. Not long after, Alex made his own attempts at a reunion. One morning, I found a bouquet of flowers at my doorstep, the card bearing a simple, I'm sorry, please come back message. The sight of them sparked more anger than affection. Without a second thought, I tossed them into the trash. His efforts didn't stop there. He tried to visit, showing up unannounced with the hope of talking things through. But I wasn't the same person he left behind. His presence, once a source of comfort, now felt like an intrusion. One evening, as he made yet another uninvited appearance, I met him at the door with a resolve as hard as steel. If you don't stop this, I'm going to the police, I warned, my voice steady and firm. Your apologies can't undo what's been done. It's over, Alex, really over. The gravity of my words finally seemed to reach him. His shoulders slumped, and with a final lingering look, he turned and walked away. That was the last I saw of him. In the time that followed, I threw myself into charity work. It became my passion, my purpose. Helping those truly in need, connecting with people who valued kindness over wealth, brought me a joy I hadn't known was missing. Living with Grandma, I found peace in our quiet routine. We'd sit and plan our next project, our next way to make a difference. It was during these moments I realized this was where I was meant to be. I had no illusions about the road ahead. It would be fraught with challenges, perhaps even heartache. But I also knew it would be filled with joy, with moments of unbridled happiness, and the kind of love that enriches the soul. And so, I live my life looking forward, not back. I work, I help, and I hope. I believe in a future where all find true love, not defined by wealth or status, but by genuine connection. And yes, one day, I'll have those three beautiful children I dream of. But for now, I'm content. I'm building a life of purpose, surrounded by love that doesn't ask for anything in return. This isn't just the end of a chapter. It's the beginning of a whole new book. And I'm the one writing it.